And so this time, this year we are just the AZ Water Luncheon or virtual luncheon. Um, so I, I think we kind of wanted to introduce some committee members. So my name's Scott Yauk. Um, I am the co-chair for the Phoenix Luncheon. Um, and then our chair is Brenda. Brenda, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, hello everyone. Uh, Brenda Danashekran, I'm with Jacobs. Um, and super excited to get the season started for the virtual webinars this year. And it's good to see you all. So, uh, and then next we have Kirsten, who's the chair for the Southern yep. Arizona Committee. So you want to say hi, Kirsten? Sure. Hi, everyone. Uh, this, I don't have my camera on, but Kirsten Wanzik. Um, I'm at the chair down in Tucson uh, for the luncheon committee. So thank you all for coming. Perfect. And then I can't actually see the participant list, but if there's anyone else involved in the committees, feel free to introduce yourself. Give you a moment. Not sure if there's anyone else. All right, so we'll we'll go ahead and move forward. So we've got a, a good presentation today and we've got a good set coming up soon as well. So our next virtual luncheon will be October 22nd, so next month. And then this will be about the PFAS management in Tucson and Marana. We'll have Jeff Biggs from Tucson Water Administrator and Scott, I don't want to try to pronounce that last name, uh, from the Marana Water, he's the Marana Water Director, and this was sponsored by Corolla and PCL. I believe this was a presentation that was canceled at the end of last season, so we're picking it up and getting it back. So you can register for this at azwater.org. And then looking, um, Shana mentioned the P PDH certificates and they're available through the AZ Water Association. Um, if you've changed your email recently or joined a new company, um, let us know um, and we can update the contact list to make sure you're getting these properly. So looking at the technical luncheon webinars for the rest of the season, um, we have one in December, January, February, and March. Um, and here's who they are and what they are and who they are sponsored by as well. Um, and then I, th I believe this is posted on the AZ Water website as well. So our sponsor today is Stantec, and we have Gary Brady from Stantec here today, and he's gonna speak a little bit about um, Stantec and what they do, and he's prepared some slides. So I'm gonna turn it over to you, Gary. Okay, thank you. So uh, I'm Gary Brady. I work in the water group for Stantec and have been there for over 30 years. And when I talked to Charlie about this presentation today that he's doing on forecasting and the uh, proposed hydrology, I wanted to kind of identify some historical type uh, material that would kind of go along with what he's presenting today. So what you see on the screen is the SRP watershed uh, from both the, uh, um, from the Salt River and then from the Verde, the Verde Salt River watershed. And SRP has seven dams that they have developed since 1903. And then the last one was finished during World War II, Horseshoe Dam, um, and it was completed as part of the war effort, which is kind of another story. But I wanted to show you guys, SRP has been around since 1903, and they started as part of the Bureau of Reclamation, which was established in 1902 um, by Theodore Roosevelt. So this kind of gives you an oversight. Uh, the, the one thing that I will tell you is diversion started at Granite Reef with its construction, which was before uh, Horseshoe or before Roosevelt Dam. And that Roosevelt Dam is gonna be the topic I wanna to talk about today. So next slide. So Roosevelt Dam, uh, they began thinking about uh, some kind of dam facility back in the late 1800s. And this picture here is from 1898. It's difficult to see, it's a little fuzzy, but there are, um, there are settlers, probably ranchers or farmers that are crossing at this location and it was called the crossing. And it was a narrow reach of the Salt River where settlers were able to cross from one side to the other. 
This happened to be the site when they explored Salt River that they determined this would be a good location for Roosevelt Dam. Uh, the photo shows right down through there. You can see the horses and the wagons, although they're pretty blurry. But I thought this was a great picture of this small corridor, narrow passageway through here. Next photo. So Roosevelt Dam began in, in uh, construction in 1903. Reclamation was established in 1902. And Salt River Project, which was then called Salt River, I think it was Salt River Valley Water Users Association, Charlie? Yes, that's true. Uh, in fact, we still have the Salt River Valley Water Users Associ Association. <laughs> okay. So uh, the population of the Phoenix area back then was about 5,000 people, the uh, valley, and now it's about four and a half million. The major reason that the valley was able to grow was because of Salt River Project. Uh, without water, there wouldn't have been any development in the valley. The other thing I will tell you is even though this uh, dam was constructed in 1911, there were diversions from the Salt River as far back as 1870, uh, beginning with, uh, it was I think it was a Kirkland McKinney Ditch Company, and that's in downtown Tempe. SRP has maintained a reach of that ditch still open uh, there along 8th Street across from um, uh, 8th Street, 8th Street Tavern. I don't, don't, Four Peaks Tavern. Don't ask me how I happen to know that, but it's in that neighborhood. And I think it's so great, even though that area is developed, SRP is maintaining that reach of open canal as it was pretty much in 1870. So what you're seeing right here is they're preparing the foundation for uh, the um, Roosevelt Dam, uh, the, the foundation, the blocks, the building blocks that they used for the dam were limestone that they quarried nearby. They blasted out of a nearby uh, quarry source and then they, they uh, prepared them and then shipped them to the site by wagon. Uh, then they had mortar that was created from the sand and gravel and limestone materials that they had nearby and those were all used. They had, they had a whole team of, of uh, quarry specialists and a whole team of um, the people that were doing the, um, the blocks and stuff too, a lot of the uh, Italian uh, uh, stone, mater, stone masters. Um, one of the things too, this, this roadway slide to the site, I think the next one will, there we go. They had several crews working on this dam site and they all happened to live together, most of them there. The, there was a, a large group of Apache workers that um, contributed to the site and it was identified on several presentations how much the Apache tribe, tribal members contributed to the project. There was also, uh, you know, the Italian stonemasons that were working on putting together a lot of the, the masonry on the dam. Uh, up in the upper left-hand corner there, you see some of the senior engineers and reclamation engineer uh, that were part of the project. Uh, certainly they were on site probably quite a bit of the time. And then uh, down in the lower right-hand corner, Charlie provided this information to me. He says this photo was likely at the Sierra Anca Mountains nearby, east of the dam. Uh, where all the construction timber was milled for a lot of their forms and and uh, uh, timber that they needed for construction of the project. Why don't we go to the next slide? So if anybody doubts whether or not they used a lot of mechanized equipment back then, this may have been the industrial age, but uh, the automobile and truck weren't really established at this time. So everything was brought to the site by uh, horses and mules and wagons and and uh, they had a daily trail going back and forth primarily from Globe but also on the highway that was being built and I say highway loosely because it was the Apache Trail. If you've ever been on the Apache Trail now and right now it's closed because of a, a uh, flood damage but you can imagine how 
traumatic it must have been for people hauling wagons along that road back in the early 1900s. And those were coming up from the valley. Next slide. So here's a kind of a, a group of slides that shows the progression of the dam uh, with the uh, uh, control building, operation building up in the upper left-hand corner uh, being uh, semi-completed by 1907. There were several floods along the Salt River and at the dam site. And in 1905, uh, Charlie identified that the site was was almost completely wiped out. So even though it started in 1903, they almost had to restart the dam in 1905 because a lot of the damage, flood damage that occurred then. And they had several floods along the alignment that uh, created those problems. In the upper right hand corner, go back to that real quick. You can see the cable system they had that would drop um, you know, cementitious materials onto the dam. They'd place it where the workers needed it for grouting together all of the blocks uh, uh, together on the dam site. And they also moved a lot of materials across, across the dam on that cable system. Okay, next slide. Hello, you have reached the Office of 21st Century Neurology. Our phones are off. Uh-oh, somebody's not muted. <laughs> So uh, right here you see a couple of pictures, uh, that picture from 1910, even though the dam looks like it is substantially, you know, uh, raised and completed, you can see some of the flooding coming over the top on the, on the uh, north side there, and that was just overtopping the, uh, the edge of the dam there. It was un uncontrolled flow going over the top of the dam. Uh, there were a number of floods during those years, but uh, through it all, they ended up uh, making sure that dam got constructed in 1911. Next photo. So here is the dedication in 1911 by Teddy Roosevelt. Uh, you can see in the upper left-hand corner, the people that came to the site in the lower left-hand corners when he was speaking in Phoenix when he visited for that uh, ceremony. Uh, but one of the things that I thought was really pretty exciting and neat about the whole thing is the many things that Teddy Roosevelt did in his career, and he identified that establishing Bureau Reclamation and the Panama Canal construction were the highlights of his life. And I thought it was pretty cool because uh, without that initial Roosevelt Dam and then the others, uh, we would not have had the development in the valley like we've had today. Next photo. So uh, the dam was completed and for a number of years uh, performed very well. And it was decided because of the materials that the dam was made with the limestone and, and grout and that we needed something a little more robust. And so SRP went on a, a pretty, uh, you know, a, a robust type approach to encasing the entire dam. Now, before that, in the early 60s, the Roosevelt Dam was put onto the list of historic preservation sites. Uh, and then it was because of this encasement and they completely changed the character of the dam. The dam was removed from that list in the late 90s. But it has got to be, I'm, and I guess I'm just an engineer guy, but I think it's one of the most beautiful structures in Arizona. And you can see up the upper right hand corner before that dam was completely raised. Uh, the 93 floods, if any of you can remember, that we had in the valley. Uh, we had a lot of overtopping then before it was raised. And then in the lower right-hand corner, you can see where the, the uh, dam is the way it is today. It was raised an additional 77 feet, which increased the storage probably about 20%, as I recall. And uh, Roosevelt Dam... Uh, its stores, and Charlie, you probably know, probably five times what the other dams combined store. So it's pretty critical to the water supply for the valley. 
So that's was kind of my introduction for Charlie and then Charlie, I, I'll, I'll turn it over to you. All right. Thank you, Gary. I think feel like I went to a presentation at SRP today. That was awesome. Some great photos too. Uh, so we're going to transition now to my more typical presentation that I make. And I believe Scott's going to run um, the slides yes. for me. Yes, Charlie. First, I'm going to introduce you, give you okay, well that introduction. Oh, there we go. Now, uh, Scott, quick question. Will I be able to see the slides that you're presenting? Oh, there we go. Yep. Okay. Well, that's going to be great. I won't even need to run them on my end then. Okay, perfect. So yeah, so today our speaker is Charlie Esther with uh, SRP. Um, he is the Surface Water Resources Manager. Um, and SRP is a water and power utility founded in 1903, as we just learned a lot about. And it serves the majority of the Phoenix metropolitan area. The Watershed Management Group is responsible for weather forecasting and support of power and water operations, watershed monitoring, runoff forecasting, reservoir operations planning, flood management reservoir operations, and drought preparedness. Charlie is the past chairman of the Oak Creek Watershed Council, a member of Carpe Diem West's leadership team, and Healthy, water, uh, Healthy Headwaters Consortium, Consortium, and promotes SRP's watershed stewardship role through an expanding internal monitoring effort, a research program with Arizona's universities, and by participation with the Forest Service and other collaborate collaborators on various forest and watershed restoration efforts. Charlie has been with SRP for 37 years and is a 1983 hydrology graduate of the University of Arizona. So I want to thank Charlie for his time today, and we're very much looking forward to his presentation. And I will turn it over to him. I'm going to stop sharing my screen for a second to bring up his slides, and then once those are up, we'll go ahead and get started. All right. Thank you, Scott. That was a great introduction. Uh, as you can tell, I'm certainly not wearing my suit today. Uh, I am actually up in the mountains southeast of Flagstaff, and but I do have a... Uh, Andrew Volkmer is standing by in case we have some sort of uh, technical difficulty here, uh, but I don't. I think we're going to be able to do just fine because we did some testing the other day. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and get started. And I think uh, everybody realizes uh, if we could go back one slide. Yeah, to the beginning. I wanted to make a little bit of call out to the summer that we just had. Uh, what a miserable summer! I, and I'm going to go over some of the details on that. Uh, so we can go ahead and go forward. So uh, Gary pretty much covered all this today, but the, the Salt River Project is actually, actually two organizations. One is the Salt River Valley Water Users Association, and that's the original part of SRP that was established in 1903. We are the Reclamation Project. We're a private company, and we deliver anywhere from 700 to 800,000 acre feet of year to our water service territory. Now, the other part of our company, which is now much, much larger and probably more familiar to most of you, is the Salt River Project Agricultural Improvement and Power District. The district was formed in 1937 as a political subdivision of the state of Arizona, and uh, its power we have over a million power customers in and around the Phoenix area. The power district was actually formed during, if you notice the date, 1937, in the midst of the Great Depression. And the reason for that was the Water Association was not being able to meet its obligations, and there was uh, a chance that it could go under. But by establishing the district as a subdivision of the state, we were able to take advantage of tax-free uh, debt issuance. And, uh, and then after World War II, the future was just extremely bright for the Phoenix area. Next slide. <clears throat> Are you still there, Charlie? I think he's frozen, Scott. I'm not sure if you can hear us. This is Andrew Volkmer. I just, can you guys hear me? 
Cool. I yes. just IM'd him so I can just continue on while he tries to get back on and uh, and go from there. So the I guess this is why I'm here as backup. <laughs> um, so the slide, uh, like Charlie was saying, this is our watershed. It's about 13,000 square miles. And um, you can see it covers the Verde on the west side that goes all the way from Williams down to Payson. And then on the east side is the Salt River and it stretches all the way over to Alpine. Um, so the, the Verde is a lot more flashier of a watershed. Uh, the elevation, average elevation isn't quite as high, whereas the salt has more of a snowpack in the winter. So if you can go over to the next slide. So this right here shows SRP's um, water service area. So basically we have our, um, six, our six reservoirs on the salt and the Verde, and the water is delivered at the bottom dam of each of those rivers. And it goes to our canal system, a granite reef diversion dam, which you can see is uh, where the Arizona Canal and the, the South Canal heads are. And it delivers it to our about 250,000 acre uh, service area using a, a bunch of canals. And then we also have uh, about 300 groundwater wells that we conjunctively use um, to deliver to meet our deliveries to our shareholders. Next slide. So this map right here shows our actual reservoir system, SRP reservoir system. You can see there's a, we have the Verde, which has Bartlett and Horseshoe and makes up of a, about 300,000 acre feet. And also there's a CC Cragen Dam, which is up on top of the rim, uh, north of Payson on East Clear Creek. And we actually do um, have some small deliveries that are made into the, the East Verde that make their way down to Horseshoe. But otherwise, Cragen's um, currently being used for the city of the town of Payson's water supply. And then on the salt side, we have the four reservoirs. And um, the total conservation on the salt side is 2 million acre feet. So you can see there's a vast imbalance um, between the two systems. And about 40% of um, inflows are on the Verde and 60% of inflows are on the salt. So um, that makes it fun for us to try to manage that system in the winter when you can, you know, some winters you can even have more flow on the Verde than the salts. And with the, the small amount of storage on the Verde, it makes it, makes it interesting. But of course, Roosevelt, um, as was mentioned earlier, has a huge amount of storage um, it has 1.6 million acre feet of conservation storage, which is, you know, you could put all the other reservoirs in, into that. Um, so for the next slide, uh, the group that, that I am and Charlie is a manager of is surface water. Um, and our, our three main goals of our group is to plan for the drought, prepare for the flood and protect the watershed. With that being said, we monitor and forecast um, weather and, and stream flow, primarily stream flow in the winter and then weather all year round. And we also, our group also handles our uh, Water Emergency Reservoir Operations Center, we like to call WEROC. Basically, when we have large floods, mostly in the winter, we are able to activate once we have to release more than 20,000 cubic feet per second from the, from the uh, reservoirs down into Granite Reef, we, we can activate We Rock, which is a 24 seven center. So we don't activate We Rock too often, but we do spend a lot of time training for it um, to make sure that we're, that we're preparing for the floods. And then we also handle a lot of the activities with the reservoirs, um, maintenance and operation coordination, when we wanna swap from the salt, which we usually deliver off the summer, or the Verde, which we usually deliver off the winter. So speaking of winter, if you go to the next slide, we're going to talk a little bit about what happened this past winter, winter 2020. This picture was, uh, I can't tell you exactly when this picture was taken, but this is on the lower salt when you where you actually have some snow. Uh, probably those are the superstitions or four peaks. I, I'm not sure of the direction of the photo, but I really like this photo, especially with the saguaros in the foreground and this, the snow-covered peaks in the background. And of course, um, 
I'm not sure if that's, uh, maybe that's Canyon Lake in the foreground too. So the next slide shows a teacup diagram. This teacup diagram, um, we show these a lot and basically it gives you an idea of where our system storage is at on the reservoir system. So November 19th, um, just probably about uh, 10 months ago, our total system storage was sitting at 66% capacity. You can see Bartlett was at 50%, Horseshoe at nine. So the, the Verde was pretty low. And then uh, Roosevelt was at 65%. You also notice that the three lower salt dams are all, are all basically full. We typically keep those full because those have hydro generation and it's more efficient um, to produce electricity if you have more head on the generators. So the, the three dams you'll want to pay attention to in terms of capacity are Roosevelt, Bartlett, and Horseshoe. So we started off 66% um, capacity, which isn't, which isn't terrible. We had had a all right winter the winter before that. So it, it kind of set us up in a, in a good position. So next slide. This graph right here shows the precipitation that we saw this past winter. The, the, the left y-axis is daily precip, which lines up with the, the bars on this graph. And the right y-axis is cumulative precipitation, which lines up with the lines. And then of course we have dates on the y-axis starting with October 1st of 2019. The green line is what actually accumulated through the winter. The green dashed line is what was the winter before. And then the red line is the normal value. So really we started the winter off pretty good. Um, we had some good storms in the end of November and beginning of De December, which we had a wet start. And then we had a, a dry period from January 1st out to the beginning of March. And that had us a little worried. There wasn't a lot of snowpack, especially on the Verde. But then luckily we had a wet end to the winter, which um, ended up giving us a pretty good um, um, winter. Uh, we were about 127% of normal. And this precipitation is for the salt and verde watershed on average. So it's that whole 13,000 square miles. That's how that 14.6 inches is, is how much we got across that area on average. So overall, it was a is actually a, a pretty good winter in terms of precipitation. It was kind of weird because it was wet and then a really long extended dry period and then a wet end, but no complaints here. So the next slide actually shows inflows into the reservoirs that this past winter. Uh, this shows Roosevelt um, inflow and storage. So, so the blue line is flow on the salt. The black line is flow on Tonto Creek, which those two are the main um, rivers that go into Roosevelt. And then the green line is storage at Roosevelt. So this really shows how um, in, the, in March, beginning of March, where we had really our peak inflows into the reservoirs. And the green line you can see really goes up. And I don't know if you remember the capacity slide, but the capacity of Roosevelt is uh, about 1.6 million acre feet of water. So you can see we were, just shy about 10,000 acre feet from um, filling up the conservation space in Roosevelt, which is fantastic. We had a peak of 20,000 CFS on, on the assault and 15,000 CFS on the, the Tonto, which aren't um, too unruly of flows, but we really, the salt, you know, once, especially we get a good snowpack, it's uh, just a, a constant producer of inflow into the reservoirs. The next slide shows the Verde and the inflows we had on the Verde. Again, you can see the beginning of March is when we um, saw the wet period um, come back. And luckily we were able to hold on to a little bit of the antecedent moisture conditions from the, the wet December. But the green line is the Verde inflow and then the red line is storage at Bartlett and the orange line is storage at Horseshoe. Um, so basically we filled up after that first peak of 27,000 CFS in the Verde. And then from basically the end of March, um, we were kind of, we, we spilled for 
quite a while until until April because reservoirs was full. So I don't know if Charlie, are you back on? Maybe not. I thought I'd saw his name pop up, but we'll just continue on. But anyways, so we we basically filled Roosevelt up and we ended up having to, to spill on the Verde, which means we had a pretty darn good winter. So if you can go on to the next slide, and it looks like Charlie's having some internet issues. It says it's really unstable. So unfortunately, you're stuck with me for the rest of the presentation. <laughs> um, so this graph right here shows salt tanto and verde inflow. Um, basically, October 1st through July 31st, we've had about 1 million acre feet of inflow into the reservoirs, which is 167% of median. And you can see that black line is the median line and the blue line is what we had in the water year 2020. So it's been really good. And, you know, we were a little worried once we got through February and hadn't seen any more um, decent storms. But once March hit, you can see inflow really skyrocketed up and that is what really saved our bacon in terms of filling the reservoirs up um, this past winter. The next slide shows how much we actually had to spill through the Verde. So um, total spill was 30,000 acre feet, um, basically started the very end of February, um, kind of middle of March is when the, the spills really picked up. Uh, that's 30,000 acre feet isn't, um, I think the year before we'd spilled over 100,000 acre feet. So still a good amount, enough to have to close the roads down below Granite Reef, the low water crossings. So probably a lot of that water, uh, that 30,000 acre feet of spill, we don't necessarily like to say it was just lost because um, I'm sure you all know, we do get a lot of natural recharge in those normally dry stream beds. So once we are, it, once we spill, a lot of that actually goes back to recharging the groundwater supplies in the valley, which is another um, benefit of having a wet winter. It just, you know, when we have these wet winters and we fill our reservoirs up and have to spill, it really just compounds the good news. So that's, that's always good. And then the next slide shows where our reservoir status um, was at at the end of the, uh, the winter. So this is May 7th, 2020. Um, Remember, I think our total system storage on November was about 66%, and this shows our total system storage at 98%, which is fantastic. You can see Roosevelt was just 10,000 acre feet shy of filling, which was the conservation, which is which is a bummer, but uh, I guess it is what it is. Hopefully, this next year we'll we'll get into flood control space. Um, some of the impacts we had on our operations. So uh, we'll, once we start to, we have to actually have virtual spill on the salt, which is just an accounting term that basically means we have a lot of water on our hands. And NCS, which is that space between the top of old Roosevelt and the top of conservation of modified Roosevelt, new conservation space, which with there's a new conserv NCS cities um, ha have rights to that water was about 17,000 acre feet short of filling. So I guess I was saying 10,000, but in reality it was 17,000. And as a result of such a wet winter, we actually had to basically use um, water from the salt and the verde um, into the summer. And then we were also able to reduce the amount of groundwater pumping. I don't know if many of you are aware, but the higher our, our groundwater pumping is uh, determined by uh, reservoir storage levels. So the higher our reservoir storage levels are, the less we have to pump, which is more good news. So of course, I think the past, what, three of the four winters we've had have been wet. So that really always begs the question, the next slide, and that is, we get this a lot and it's, is the drought over? <laughs> is it the, the left picture where we have Bartlett gushing full of water spilling, or is it the right picture where we have basically a dry Roosevelt? That picture was taken back in 2003, I believe, where we were at like 
10% capacity. Well, as the next slide points out, uh, the internal optimist, which that's James Walter, one of our meteorologists, and he is very much so an optimist, would say, well, three of the last four years have been wet, so a 50% Roosevelt Dam, that, to him, that looks half full, which I don't know. Well, we'll what's, what's the argument against that? And I think the next slide might point that out. But seven of the last 10 years have been dry. So I personally, I think that means that that 50% Roosevelt is half empty. Um, so, so as we always say, it's really hard to tell when we're gonna be out of this drought until we are, are definitely out of it. And the next slide kind of goes into a little bit of the numbers with that um, and talks about mega drought severity. So currently the drought we're in is actually from 2011 to 2018 has the lowest um, consecutive eight year annual inflow on record. And if you even go back further than that to 2018, it's the lowest consecutive 23 year annual inflow on record. So our drought could, has been going on for about 23 years, over 23, well, it's tough to tell because we've had a couple wet years lately, but droughts can last um, 20 to 35 years. And from what we can see, based on tree ring records too, is that the current drought we're in is the most severe drought we have on record. This uh, graphic right here was put together by uh, Dr. Kevin Murphy and it, it looks through some of the past mega droughts that we've had. The one that we used to plan to is that 16th um, century, the, 1660, the 16th century drought, which is the, the one that dips down a couple times low and you can see that how um, our cumulative de deficit of basin supply is lower than that one ever was. So really the question is what's going to happen with that that blue arrow? Is it going to is it going to go up and get us out of this drought or is it going to go back down and continue with the drought? And like I said earlier, we probably won't know that until we're um, well out of it. So of course, I'll just give you the uh, waffling uh, answer with, is the drought over? And it's, I don't know, we'll find out. <laughs> All right, so enough about this past winter and droughts. Let's talk a little bit about the, the past monsoon um, season, or I mean, you'll hear a lot is the non-soon, <laughs> which is unfortunate. So this graph again is cumulative watershed precipitation. We're talking about water on, uh, precipitation on the whole watershed, not just Phoenix. Keep that in mind. That's why you'll see that the uh, the median is actually pretty high. But basically, from June 15th, which is um, what they say is the start of the monsoon, through September 14th, we've had 1.9 um, inches of average watershed precipitation, which is 33% of median. So that's, that's pretty abysmal, unfortunately. Um, and actually this is, it's an inch drier or an inch less than last year. And um, it's been the uh, driest monsoon on record for the Salt and Verde watershed. And um, unfortunately, I, I, that winter precip graphic, I think we were at 130, 3% of normal. This dry monsoon has actually uh, drawn our water year percent of normal down to 16.6 inches, which is now 96% of normal. So yeah, it's been abysmal. Um, the next slide shows the precipitation percent of normal. And you can really see how bad it's been. We've as our as a previous graph pointed out, we were 33% of normal, and that's the way it's been for the entire um, Southwest. Yeah, Phoenix is actually an outlier in this graph because the an isolated thunderstorm just happened to hit the airport, which is the official measuring station of Phoenix, and dropped 0.9 inches on it. So that's kind of it's kind of um, you know, you, you usually on the news hear how much precip Phoenix has had at the airport, but that might even be a little bit 
um, optimistic. <laughs> But basically, the entire state has been 50, 5 to 50 percent of normal rainfall this monsoon season. All right, so the next slide actually shows the drought monitor. And this past winter really got most of Arizona out of um, the drought. And, and the drought monitor typically is more on a, a short term drought basis compared to what I was talking about, the mega drought, where we're looking at years and years of um, drought. But in the short term on June 1st, we were basically out of it. And now after this abysmal monsoon season, you can see all of Arizona is classified in some type of drought. A lot of eastern Arizona and northwest Arizona is actually in the extreme drought. For our watershed, that basically mean, comes down to being in a severe drought and an extreme drought. So not good news, unfortunately, after having such a, uh, a great winter this past this past year the next slide shows kind of why we had such a terrible monsoon basically the monsoon high which we like to see around the four corners area um, was suppressed to the south um, and that high was stronger than normal so that really blocked any precipitation or any uh, moisture from coming up from the gulf that in those easterlies they usually provide that moisture or just we're not there. So the next slide shows shows and shows how that points out. This is the dew points in Phoenix. Um, the black, thick black line is where we typically see that climatologically the average throughout the, the monsoon where the dashed red is what we've seen in 2020. And We've just had a lot of dry days with no moisture in the air. So uh, the climatological start of the monsoon is when the dew point is above 55 degrees. And we had three, or I think for three consecutive days. And you can see that's pointed out where um, that occurred towards the end of July. And that was the second latest start of the monsoon that we've had. And then, um, Beginning of September is when we've dipped below the climatological um, monsoon, and that's really the end of the wet phase. This past, that, that end of August was really one of the better parts of the monsoon, and it was still not very great. So how did that affect our, our temperature on the next slide? Basically, it was hot. <laughs> the lack of moisture really contributed to, contributed to that that hotness. We didn't have the cool mornings that sometimes we'll get when we have um, the moisture in the air. So some of the records that you'll see, we, we actually had the hottest climatological summer, June, June, July, and August, the hottest July, the hottest August, the greatest number of days where the morning low was equal to or grady, greater than 90 degrees Fahrenheit. The old one was 15 days and the new was 28 days. So we had 28 days where the low was greater than 90 degrees. And we had the greatest number of days where the average temperatures were equal to or greater than 100 degrees. The old one was 19 days and the new record that we set this past summer was 38 days. So it was hot. And my personal opinion is the worst part about this summer has been that morning low staying above 90 degrees for so long because it's just hard to get a reprieve from the heat. To put that a little bit in perspective, this next slide shows um, what we could equate this to. So if you go to the next slide, basically the, the records that were set in 2020, the temperature records would be like Barry Bonds hitting 117 home runs in, in this shortened COVID season of Major League Baseball at the age of 56 with no performance enhancing drugs. So <laughs> that just puts a little bit of perspective on how ridiculously hot this summer has been. The year of 2020 is definitely not going to go in the record books as being the most comfortable year. <laughs> Yeah, thanks, Shauna. That was a great slide. I think James Walter, our meteorologist, put that together. So I have to credit him, him with it. <laughs> but uh, so 
it wasn't just the record heat that got us. Now, I, I will caveat this with we don't typically rely on filling the re- we don't re- rely on filling the reservoirs with flow in in the summer from the monsoon because ET is so high. But with that being said, July 2020 had the second lowest inflow on record, the Salt, Tonto, and Verde, which is the, the inflow into the reservoirs. And August 2020 had the lowest inflow on record. So you start adding all those low flows up and assuming we're going to have continue to have a dry September, which fingers crossed, maybe we'll have a, a few tropicals come through. But Monsoon season 2020 is on track to have the lowest July through September inflow on record. So again, we don't necessarily rely on um, flows into the reservoirs during the monsoon, but it's still nice to have 30,000 more acre feet of flow in August compared, you know, relative to what we're getting right now. So where does that put us? The next slide shows another teacup diagram. We're still sitting pretty good on, I mean, despite the dry summer, we're still sitting pretty good on the reservoirs. Actually, we're sitting extremely well on the reservoirs. The total system storage is at 83%. Roosevelt has been slowly creeping down because we're make, we're making our deliveries right now on the salt. Um, horseshoes at zero, but we, we draw a horseshoe down every year um, for our habitat conservation plan. So going into this next winter, with the reservoirs being as full as they are, and if we can get an average amount of runoff into the reservoirs, I would, if I were a betting man, I would say we were gonna we're gonna fill up Roosevelt. But it, we'll kind of go through it at the end to to see what we think is gonna happen this next winter and and whether we can reach that. A few other things that we'd like to cover um, on the next slide and talk about because they're very relevant to um, water supply in the valley are the fires that we've seen this past this past fire season so between the uh, bush fire and the salt fire which the bush fire was in the four peaks area basically um, bordered by 188 the bee line and the the uh, reservoirs to the south and then the salt fire which occurred northwest of globe right where um, salt, the Salt River basically goes into Roosevelt Lake. Between those two fires, we've burned almost 220,000 acres. So the U.S. Forest Service does modeling after these fires to see how it impacts peak discharge. And basically for the, the two 10, 25, and 100 year storm events, we can see a 100 to 200% increase in peak discharge. So this is really concerning to a lot of folks, including SRP, because a lot of the the, uh, contributing area, these watersheds go directly into our reservoirs. Our main three concerns for SRP was Sycamore Creek into the Verde below Bartlett Dam. And a lot of that has to do with water quality because we have, the, the Sycamore Creek goes in below Bartlett, which means that we can't capture any of the, the ash-laden flows that could occur with these runoff events and have to pass that through our system, which can be make it very difficult for the cities to treat. Um, and then Cottonwood Creek into Saguaro Lake, which flows off um, from the Four Peaks area. Our concern with that is because uh, we keep Saguaro Lake full about 90, you know, you typically around 93% for hydropower. And um, not knowing how the fire could impact Cottonwood Creek could really, in, in impact runoff into Cottonwood Creek can really impact operations of, of uh, Saguaro Lake. Uh, going back to last year, September 23rd, we had a large runoff event on the um, Woodbury burn scar, and we had a spill water on the lower salt system because it was such a large event and there, uh, the fire had changed the hydrology. So that's one of our concerns. And then there's the Tonto and Pinal Creek into, into Roosevelt Lake. So those are our three concerns. And in order to monitor the situation with those, um, the next slide shows some of the, the things that we've, we've put in to, to see 
how the fire will impact runoff. We put in a, water, a few water quality auto samplers. That's the picture shown on the left. Basically, that's an ISCO sampler where we have a bottle in it that can collect first flush water samples for a water quality analysis. We have a float, we installed some flotography um, on Cottonwood Creek. And um, we use that to basically take pictures and look at a stage. From that, we're able to see the, the magnitude of flows in Cottonwood Creek. Not necessarily live with this flotography setup, but, but we can go back through, download the data, and to get an I and, and determine flows. And then we also, surface water also set out a bunch of cellular cameras in these areas that are just simple game cameras that actually have a live feed. They take a picture every 15 minutes and we can look at those. And that's more of to see if there's some large debris flows coming into those areas that, that allow us to act and coordinate with our operations um, folks. So we were able to put cellular cameras up at Cottonwood Creek, Slate Creek, uh, Sycamore Creek, Kitty Joe, all those areas we're keeping an eye on from the fire. And uh, the photography went in at Cottonwood Creek, and then we put some water quality samplers on Tonto Creek and uh, Cottonwood Creek. So we're really trying to, well, I guess the next slide kind of goes through all that too. And this is a good picture. Again, I'll credit James Walter. He's done a lot. He's done a lot for this on this fire work. It shows the different types of monitoring systems that we have throughout because of these um, fires. So overall, we're um, trying to trying to monitor the situation. And then the next slide actually shows um, how we're able to monitor it. So the you know the monsoon has been pretty abysmal, but we did have a significant event on August twenty second where we had about an inch to an inch and a half of precip on the lower half of the bushfire burn scar northwest of the, of the lakes. And um, this resulted in ash debris flows in the Roosevelt Lake, Apache Lake, and Saguaro Lake. And then we were able to actually capture that um, on our cameras. You can see Sycamore Creek area and Cottonwood Creek area. Unfortunately, our cameras don't work the greatest at night, but uh, this was early morning flows and that, that storm had occurred at, at night. Um, but luckily we were able to um, monitor this situation, see that there were ash laden flows in Sycamore Creek and there is some travel time down to Granite Reef. And through some operational strategies of mixing the Verde River water flows with some other water sources, we're able to reduce those turbidity, turbidity, turbidity levels um, so that water entering into our canal system was of better quality for treatment at the municipal water treatment plants. So overall, we've, we've, um, these fires have had an impact on how we operate um, and monitor the, the situation and have really taught us some important lessons in how we can reduce turbidity to our municipal customers and how we can continue to monitor the watershed. All right, so the next slide. Of course, unfortunately, Charlie cut off, so you're stuck with me trying to figure out what's gonna happen this next winter. Um, I made the bold statement that if we were to have an average winter, we would fill up Roosevelt, but I still don't know if we're gonna have a wet winter. So which will it be? This is our meteorologist, Bo Sfoma. He's unsure. Um, of course, he's a meteorologist, so he, he'll waffle a lot about this type of stuff. So the next slide shows you what we have used in years past. I think you've all probably seen this. We've used nature predictors for, for determining the winter outlook. But unfortunately, climate change has really resulted in these predictors losing their forecast skill. So the next slide shows that we're not going to use predictors anymore. We're going to just start taking things into our own hands and we're going to use some old technology with proven results. And that is the rainmaker gun. So 
I'm not, you know, I never, I didn't say I'm a betting man, but I'm maybe be one because we're going to make it rain. <laughs> and the next slide actually shows more of a, uh, a uh, newer technology. Um, but I don't think we're going to be shooting out a hundred dollar bills. We're just going to be shooting out rain. So I guess we're going to try to guarantee a wet snowy winter this year. We'll actually see what happens, but in all seriousness, the next slide shows kind of the uh, the La Nina, El Nina sea surface conditions. Unfortunately, the current sea surface conditions indicate a La Nina condition. Um, Enzo is the strongest predictor, but the uh, skill is relatively weak, at, especially at this point. But it is greater for La Nina. Um, in addition to a in addition, we have a, a positive uh, PDO or Pacific, and that's weakly correlated to wet winters, um, where a warm positive AMO is correlated with a dry winter. So I think it's kind of a mixed bag right now. Unfortunately, we are in La Nina, which t t typically is, uh, is drier. The next slide shows exactly how the, the forecast is panning out, and you can see the as we get into the winter, December, January, February, it is forecasted to be a La Nina. And then towards the end of the winter, summer, we, we come, out of it, come out of it. The next slide shows how it typically, um, on average, um, we've had how much precipitation we've had with different um, La Nina seasons. So, or the, Typically, we have 7.8 inches, and the La Nina average is 5.4, which would not uh, do well for us, unfortunately. So the National Weather Service on the next slide has a three-month outlook for January, February, and March. And currently, for precipitation, they are putting basically the whole state of Arizona in the below um, normal chances, 40% probability of being below normal. So again, hopefully I can use the Rainmaker technology to turn these predictors around and at least get an average winter so we can fill the reservoirs up. The, the last slide is something we usually like to end these predictions with. They're very difficult to make, especially if they are about the future. So the best we can do is plan accordingly. And that's what we try to do in surface water with, uh, with our water supply. We don't like to necessarily take a gam gamble. So we're going to just plan accordingly. With that being said, that's, that's all that I have. So I will entertain any questions. And if Charlie is able to join, um, I will uh, let him answer any. I do see that um, Gary asked a question. What is SRP concluding about fi from findings about water quality impacts like additional turbid turbidity and any harmful minerals slash chemicals? Mike, do you have any answers to that? Mike Plu? Yeah, can, can you guys hear me? Yep. All right, great. Um, well, we're trying to get the data to find out what's going to happen. I, I can tell you right now that um, things are slowly changing, but uh, at this point, with such a dry monsoon uh, season, we haven't seen a huge change like we did when uh, we got that big downpour last year off the Woodbury uh, fire. But I've, I've, as we stated before, it's kind of like it's really difficult to predict the future, but I, I would suggest that and when it comes to organic carbon in particular, I would see things being hovering on the higher side for, for some time until this thing stabilizes. So we're looking at uh, organic carbon around five or six right now. I wouldn't be surprised if it creeped up, um, but we're doing everything we can to mitigate it where we can. Uh, and like Andrew was talking earlier, we did successfully manage the, uh, the last runoff event pretty well. So we had flows coming in with about 50 milligrams per liter of organic carbon and, and out the door uh, to the canals, we had it uh, trimmed down to about nine for that day and a half. It was like that. So 
Um, if it comes in little spurts like that, hopefully we can manage it, but we'll, we're just gonna have to continue to collect our data and, and see how we can work with it into the future. Yeah, and I will say that um, we're gonna continue to monitor since we had such a dry monsoon and a lot of those areas probably didn't get significant precipitation, at least on a water um, quantity side of things, we're gonna continue to monitor the situation th through the winter. Are there any other questions? Hey, Andrew, this is Charlie. I want to thank you in front of everyone for doing such a fantastic job of recovering for me. I have no idea what happened, but my computer just completely shut down. Uh, so it's always good to have a backup, and you did a fantastic job. So I really appreciate it. Oh, no problem, Charlie. That's what I'm here for. <laughs> Hello, Perfect. this is Vinda. Um, I don't have a question, but just a comment. This is a fantastic presentation. We look forward to this every year. And I want to thank Charlie for putting it together and especially Andrew for picking it up um, and running it for us when we had issues. So thank you both. No problem. I know we always look forward to giving this presentation. So. Yes, this is Scott. So yeah, thank you both. Uh, I don't see any other questions, just a lot of praise coming in from the, the chat box here. So you guys did a great job. And as Brenda said, we always look forward to it. And just just like every year, it always delivers. Hopefully like the uh, our winter pre precipitation this year. <laughs> Fingers crossed. <laughs> Perfect. Well, if, if there's no additional questions or if anyone wants to ask a question, feel free to turn your mic on. We'll, we'll stay open for a couple more minutes. Um, if not, thanks everyone um, for coming to the presentation today and we look forward to seeing you for the next presentation next month.